Welcome back to The Vault. Today's video is an interview with Corporal John Ramsey and Sergeant Justin Wall from the Professional Standards Division. This interview took place on July 30, 2021. Corporal Ramsey was the secondary officer investigating Jeremy Dewitt for his felonious activities. Fortunately for Corporal Ramsey, he was not on site the day Jeremy was arrested by Vidler which led to this internal investigation. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Thank you to all of my new subscribers and viewers. This particular video is a request from Militia 3333. I'm Sergeant Justin Wall of the Orange County Sheriff's Office, Professional Standards Section. Today's date is July 30th, 2021, and the current time is 8.42 a.m. This interview is being conducted at the Office of Professional Standards, located at 2500 West Colonial Drive. I'm interviewing. Can you just state your name and rank for me? Uh, John Ramsey, Corporal. And you're currently assigned to... Sector 5, day shift. Patrol. Patrol B-side. All right. Also present in the room for this interview is Sergeant uh, Michael Harmon of the Professional Standards Section, as well as... Jay Smith, FOP 93, representing Corporal Ramsey. Okay. Corporal Ramsey, are you aware that I'm recording this interview? I am. Other than being compelled by Sheriff's Office policy to answer questions related to conduct and employment, has anyone threatened, coerced, or offered you any preferential treatment to give this statement? No. All right. I'm going to swear you in. Um, I... Justin Wall, a notary public commissioned by the state of Florida. Commission number CG975310, expiring on April 1st, 2024. We'll place you under oath. Can you raise your right hand? Mm -hmm. Under penalty of perjury, do you swear or affirm the statement you are to provide regarding this internal investigation will be the truth? Yes. Okay. Until the conclusion of this investigation, you are prohibited from communicating with anyone other than your legal counsel, other representative, or someone from the professional standards section regarding the substance of this investigation or complaint. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. Are you under the influence of drugs or alcohol that may impair your testimony? No. Do you understand the internal investigation notification form that I asked you to sign prior to this interview? That's this one here? Yes. Okay. Uh, were you given the opportunity to review the statements and evidence provided to you prior to this interview? Yes. Do you have any questions regarding the evidence you received? Not at the moment. Not at the moment? Mm. Okay. Florida Statute 112.532 states all questions must come from or through one investigator. Do you desire to waive this right? No. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we'll get started. I've got uh, several different things that uh, I want to ask about, okay? Mm -hmm. um, first off, what was your position and, and your duties with the Sheriff's Office on March 23rd, 2021? I was uh, a corporal assigned to Motors, uh, Team 1 or Squad 1, uh, which would be Sector 1. Okay. Uh, and how long have you been employed in law enforcement? Uh, I think pretty close to 25 years. I was with Sanford Police Department before here. Okay. How long with the Sheriff's Office? Uh, I think 21 years. Um, Maybe so, a little more. So what positions have you held in the agency? I guess what, what experience and background do you have? For the Sheriff's Office? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, I've worked patrol as a, uh, as a deputy, evenings, midnights. Uh, I've worked as a supervisor, as a, a corporal in uh, patrol on evenings and day shift. Uh, I've worked in mounted. I was a supervisor in mounted. Uh, I've worked as a supervisor in motors, once again back on patrol as a supervisor. Uh, I've been part of the uh, recruiting task force when they had it several years ago. I've uh, been doing CVSAs and backgrounds for I think it's like 14 years or so. Uh, what else? Specifically any investigative uh, experience, specialized investi investigative experience? You mean like what we do NCI, as a deputy? And yes, CID, CID beyond beyond patrol deputy. When I worked for Sanford, I was a detective. Okay. In uh, what capacity? I worked everything from property crimes to homicides, everything in between. Okay. How long did you do that for? Uh, I want to see like two years, two and a half years, something like that. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, specifically to what happened on March 23rd, um, how did you become aware of Sergeant Bidler's traffic stop that day? Uh. I was at the 7-Eleven on OBT, right by Sector 4, and I received a call. I think it was 7-Eleven. might have been the racetrack. I was getting gas. And I received a call from John Reeves uh, saying that Sergeant Baylor wanted to talk to me. 
uh, by the time I, and I was leaving there, I was driving to Sector 4. I was heading to Sector 4 to do my NCIC, FCIC uh, research because uh, over in Sector 1 it just wasn't, it, it kept crashing my computer. So I was going to go plug in in my office, which happens to be there. Uh, so John Reeves called me. I guess I missed the call from uh, Sergeant Midler, and he put uh, he gave the phone to, uh, to Sergeant. Uh, I want to call him Keith. Keith, mm -hmm. and uh, Keith said he had just arrested Jeremy Dewitt for carrying concealed weapon, and uh, he wanted to talk and wanted to know if uh, where I was. And I told him well, I'm busy uh, at Sector Four, so he says, "Okay, good. We're heading that way." That was it. Okay. Uh, he was still on the traffic stop, I'm assuming, at that point? I, I'm assuming, yeah. You presume so. Okay. Uh, did did you or Sergeant Bidler or anyone else um, that you know of have any intelligence that Mr. DeWitt was going to be on I-4 that day? Mm -mm. I'm sorry, no? No, sir. Yeah. Okay. No, I... The only times I ever saw DeWitt was once in 2015 when uh, my guys did a traffic stop with him. Uh, when I arrested him in 2019, when I interviewed him in 2019, and I think in court, I've seen him a couple times, but beyond that, uh, yeah. Okay, so you didn't have any uh, specific mm -mm. intelligence? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, was Sergeant Midler actively searching for Mr. Duet? No. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so fast forward, the traffic stuff's done, um, and you're at Sector 4. Uh, they come to meet you, I presume. Uh, did, at any point, did you see the duty belt that was worn by Mr. DeWitt? I did. And what? just describe that to me. What did you see? Uh, well, I would walked over to the, uh, the traffic side. I went and plugged my computer in so it would boot back up and, and get online so I can start the, uh, the testing. And uh, I walked over to find Acting Captain Crab because uh, I didn't want to do the interview. So he wasn't in his office. As I turned around and started walking back towards the door to exit, Sergeant Villar or, or Keith walked in with the, uh, the duty belt. When I first saw it, I thought it was John Reeves' belt because I knew John Reeves with, was with him because of his phone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I asked him, why do you have John's belt? He goes, no, this is uh, DeWitt's belt. Okay. Did you see the pepper ball weapon? Yeah, I saw what looked like a firearm in the holster. Okay. Um, was it was it in the holster? Mm-hmm. You saw it? Okay. Um, was it similar to what you carry on? It looked just like your, ours. Your belt? Okay. Um, you, you just... Just to touch on it, you mentioned you didn't want to do the interview. What do you mean? You were going to find an acting Captain Crab mm -hmm. uh, because you didn't want to do the interview. So had Sergeant Bidler asked you to do an interview over the phone? No, no, no. But when he said that uh, that he wanted to talk uh -huh. and wanted to know where I was, I was kind of guessing that that's probably what it was. Okay. Uh, why didn't you want to do it? Past experience. What do you mean? The threats... The, uh, the uh, interference, the the potential for being fired for the the last time in 2019 when we were shut down with the investigation, and I was worried that uh, that was going to come back. Okay. And I was right. <laughs> okay. Did you express to acting Captain Crab you didn't want to do it? Uh, I I didn't get the opportunity, but yes, I did. I'm sorry, you, you didn't get the opportunity, but yes, to, you did. To give out the full explanation, but, uh, so he came in, and uh, we were looking at the belt. Everybody in the office, the secretaries, all, all uh, you know, the, the red light people, they were all out there because they all thought, you know, that was a real gun and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're standing around right outside Crab's office. He had like a little, little table-like thing, cart. So we were standing there, and... Uh, he came over and, and was talking. He was on the phone with the major, and he was talking to the major, telling him what he had. And uh, he got off the phone with the major and said, the major's good with everything. He just wants to see pictures of the gun or something to that effect. So I told him, I'll, I'll snap some pictures for you. And I'd already started. 
And he goes, no, 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 I'm going to do them from my iPhone so I can send them immediately. So, all right. So he uh, took the pictures and he sent them. And then Keith said something about uh, that he wanted to interview DeWitt or that De DeWitt wanted to talk or something to that effect. And uh, uh, Krabs said, no, he goes, uh, with everything going on with you and him and, and the paperwork you're going to have to do, focus on that. To, to Keith. Keith. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only people that were there, because I listened to the interview, uh, Cal Wacker was not there. He was not present in the building. He was gone. Uh, <clears throat> I know in there, I think uh, Crab said he was there. He was not. Uh, so he, it was John Reeves, mm -hmm. and I can tell you. So Crab was standing here mm -hmm. in front of his office, kind of facing this direction, though. I was standing here next to him. Keith was standing here. And uh, John Reeves was standing right here. So all around this little table, smaller mm -hmm. than this. And <clears throat> Reeves said something about he had to go somewhere or something, so he was fixing to leave, but he hadn't walked out yet. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to, I'm going to play it, make sure I do it in the correct order. So uh, he was talking about, or uh, Keith was talking about uh, interviewing him because he wanted to talk. And uh, Crab looked at me and said, John, you do the interview. Uh, Keith, you go get the paperwork done or something to that effect. And then uh, he said something about he wanted to make sure somebody was in the room with us. And he looked at Reeves, but Reeves said he had something to do. So he said the, uh, the, uh, the officer that, or the deputy that uh, transported him. So I think that was Alex or Alexander or something like that. Okay. He said you could just use him, have him sit in the room. So, okay. Uh, at okay, the end so of it, I'm going to get to it. Okay. At the end of it, if you, because you asked the question about my body cam, uh, what would they were laughing about? You're assuming we were all laughing, but you said what were we all laughing about? Uh -huh. I wasn't laughing. <clears throat> I looked right at Crab. I said, you know what's going to happen. I'm going to get terminated and you're going to get demoted. And his comment was, as long as I get to keep one stripe. And then Keith said something to the effect that as long as I get to keep two stripes, one over his, or something to that effect. And then we walked over. Are you uh, referring to the, the part that is... At the very beginning the of the body cam. Body cam room? The very where beginning. the audio is not recorded? Correct. Okay. You see him pointing like this? Uh -huh. That's what it was, because I said, you know what's going to happen here. I was very uncomfortable with it, but he gave me a direct order, basically. He told me to do it. There was nothing illegal, immoral, or, you know... Uh, uh, unethical about it, so but I made sure to tell him. I said, "You know what's going to happen here. Okay. I'm going to get terminated. You're going to get demoted." And his comment back was, well, "As long as I get to keep one strike." And then Keith was Who, like, "Who's comment back?" Uh, acting Kevin Crab. Okay. His comment back was, "As long as I get to keep one strike." And Villers was, "As long as I get to keep two. Okay. And that was the point where you guys were kind of laughing or joking. Or I was they, not laughing. They, I think, I, th I, think I think if I remember the video right, I think a couple mm -hmm. of people were laughing. Yeah, I, th I think uh, Crab was laughing like, yeah, as long as I get to keep one type thing. Okay. okay. Nobody was laughing at anything else other than that. I mean, I don't, it was more of a humorous giggle. Not It wasn't like yeah, laughing. You said in a joking type manner. I didn't say it in a joking manner. But they... Okay. Yeah, they came back, I think, in a joking manner. I, I don't... I don't okay. think they took it as serious as I did because of the way we left off with the case and... December, okay. of 2019. Okay. Uh, were you aware of the criminal charges against Mr. DeWitt at that point? Uh, I was. What were the charges? Uh, I was told uh, carrying a concealed weapon. Okay. Um, so I need to try and understand this uh, carrying concealed weapon thing. Um, so the, you saw the the weapon in the in the holster uh, and it looked like a gun. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody's disputing that. Correct. Um, but you say a gun, a, a firearm. Firearm, yeah. It looked like a firearm, mm -hmm. and I don't think anybody was disputing that. Um, but how? How? Explain to me this concealed thing. How does? I mean, you've been doing this for twenty-five years. How do you come to the conclusion that this is concealed? Well, one case law supports it, and two, uh, you don't know what it is until you have to take it out and physically take it apart in some manner to the to figure out what it is. Okay, what case law? Uh, I think Keith might have given you one, but if not, there's a couple of different case laws on it. Uh, 
some of it was dealing with, uh, like one was, I don't know if I have that one, but I'll look. One was uh, an individual goes into a bank to rob the bank. <clears throat> uh, he has, it's like a, a pellet gun or a BB gun stuck in his pants right here, just the handle of it showing, so just the very top portion of it showing. Robs the bank, walks out, before he walks out, tells the lady, you know, shows his, uh, opens his shirt again, shows it and walks out uh, saying, you know, don't call anybody. Search warrant's done on his, they figure out who it is, they go to his house, the search warrant's done on the house, they recover the gun. It turns out to be like either a BB gun or a pellet gun. You have to look, they're both fairly the same. Uh, that was not loaded. However, they had charged him with armed robbery with a firearm. I know it goes up to the courts and everything, and they, they say, well, it wasn't a firearm, it was a BB gun. So how can you charge him with armed robbery with a firearm? Because obviously the charge is enhanced. And the courts came back and said, uh, it doesn't matter, it's, it's what the person uh, assumed it was at the time. She thought it was a firearm. So even if it's a weapon, it's still the same. It's still going to be the same charge. So that was one uh, case law. And the other one I think he gave you is the one that uh, talks about the individual who stops uh, on a traffic stop and he has a, a, a handgun on the seat. Uh, it's covered by flowers. You can see just the uh, end of it, so you know it's, it's some type of a pistol. And the Supreme Court came back and said that that was a uh, concealed firearm, uh, and it was unloaded, but it didn't matter. It's because of the way it was concealed. They didn't have a uh, permit or whatever. Okay, I'm familiar with that one, yeah. so, but that one deals specifically with the firearm. So um, I, I guess, do you have any, uh, it, it all comes down to this, this uh, ordinary, um, observation, right? Of the average person, correct. Of the average person. So, whether or not they can determine if it's a weapon. I have the um, jury instructions here. Um, the term ordinary sight of, of a person. I'll just get to the last sentence. However, a weapon is not concealed if although not fully exposed, its status as a weapon is detectable by ordinary observation. Is a pepper ball a weapon? It's a weapon. Okay. Not a firearm. Um, so, it's, he can't, its status he cannot as a, carry regardless. Well, he, what I'm saying is that, that although it's not concealed, its status as a weapon is detectable by ordinary observation. Correct. As a firearm, it looked like a firearm. It's detected as a firearm. The average person would think that that's a firearm. Okay. I mean, would you not agree with that? <clears throat> if, I, if, I, I don't I think mean, that the the statute. Um, it, Differentiates that the uh, let's just uh, the object itself is not concealed, correct? It is. It's concealed. The only thing you see is the hand grips. The object, the physical object. But it also right. says this, this it phone says, right here. No, right, is, is it also not says in those right. jury instructions that uh, it does not have to be completely concealed to be concealed. Right, but the very next sentence well, says, however, it. if although. A weapon is not concealed if, although not fully exposed, its status as a weapon is detectable by ordinary observation. Would you agree that it, its status as a weapon of some kind is, would be detectable by ordinary observation? Still saying that, yeah, you, you don't know it, it is concealed because <clears throat> can he, he? He's a convicted felon. Can he have a firearm? No, right? So the fact that he's concealing that it's a pepper ball gun and he cannot conceal uh, a self defense weapon, for example, like a can of pepper spray, he cannot conceal that. Uh, to conceal it, it's the same thing. But it's, concealed it's would be like in your pocket, where you can't see it. Or where that a normal this, person could not. Can, can you see the object? Like, can you physically see uh, the the object in your holster? 
you can see that something's in the holster and it looks like a firearm. Okay. Um, and is a firearm a weapon? Well, I mean, is a bicycle a vehicle? I, I, that's not what I asked. Well, I know, but firearm I mean, a weapon. well, I mean, a knife is a weapon too, but a firearm is not the same. I mean, obviously, a knife and a firearm are both considered weapons, but one is, you know, okay. that projects by explosion, whereas. So is a firearm a weapon? It falls under the weapon category, yes. Okay. So then, therefore, it's it's detectable as a weapon by ordinary sight. Well, not until it's taken out, because you don't know what it is. The average person would think, especially the way he's dressed with the gun belt on. And, and I'm not and it, I'm not disagreeing with that. Right. I'm not disagreeing with that. Right. Uh, but that's not what statute says. Uh, I think you're trying to mix up what the statute says, but it, it says that if it's concealed, he concealed the fact that that was not a true firearm okay. for the purpose of getting people to believe that it's a real firearm. And, and I'm not disputing that. Mm -hmm. I'm not disputing that. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. But as far as the statute goes, that's what, that's the contention. Um, it's my understanding that Sergeant Bidler uh, realized that Mr. DeWitt, what he was doing was illegal after watching the Dr. Phil episode. Did you watch the Dr. Phil mm -hmm. show? I did. Um, did you have any discussions with Sergeant Bidler after the show and prior to this arrest about the legality of the pepper ball gun? I don't recall if we had uh, specific conversations about it. We did, I mean, we talked uh, that he was on, obviously, Dr. Phil. Uh, and the, I think the reason, as a matter of fact, I think a lot of the discussion was uh, in Major Hosey's office when he had us come to his office, uh, which when in his testimony he says that uh, it was Keith, myself, and Cal Wacker there, and it wasn't. It was just me and Keith there. Cal was not there. Uh, and the major said that, uh, I remember if he specifically said it or somebody told us, but that all senior staff were being required to watch it because the joke was, you know, they were doing popcorn while watching DeWitt. Uh, but they were required to watch, watch the Dr. Phil show to be familiar with this guy or something to that effect. and. Uh, he wanted us to update him because he was just coming to the unit. He wanted more information, detailed information about uh, DeWitt and, and what had transpired prior. And I think in that meeting, that's when we discussed the uh, Dr. Phil stuff. But I don't. Was there any discussion specifically about the, the pepper ball weapon? I, I don't recall. Okay. Um, did you seek out any legal advice regarding this particular charge? Um, had you, or was this the, kind of the first, when, when the arrest was made, was that their first? Uh, well, we had looked at this stuff before. Then? No, we'd looked at this stuff before, and in conversations with uh, uh, State Attorney Miller, uh, he had advised us on if we came across it and wound up arresting him again with that pepper ball, pepper ball gun, what actions to take to uh, further that charge. What did he advise you sense. on that? So, in the Mahoney case, <clears throat> we were looking to charge him with it, and Steve Miller's, uh, he, he was getting weird phone calls from the sheriff's office and pushback, so he was getting kind of nervous. Actually, he was asking us if, if there's some type of criminal interference going on with the investigation, and is this something that they need to look at at the sheriff's office? And we were like, hey, look, we're just doing what we're supposed to be doing. We don't know what's going on, but it is weird. So he said, uh, well, for the Mahoney case, we, we have enough good charges. He goes, uh, this one is not, does not look like it's going to fit very well for us because we don't have any of the, uh, the equipment. We don't have the gun belt. We don't have the gun, the uniform, all the badges. Everything. He said, if we had the totality of everything, it would be a good case to present. Uh, because I know, I remember there was talk about that uh, although there's case law that relates to it, there's nothing that's specific. So this would be one of those things that would be good for making case law. Because uh, imagine now if everybody's out there running around with... Stephen, Stephen Miller said that? Yeah, well, that was in the discussion. I don't remember exactly who said it, but that was in the discussion, yes. That this would be one of those things for case law. Uh, but he, 
I, I believe he um, said something to the effect of, it's not a tree that I want to bark up right now. That's, For that's that specific case, I think that was, yeah. Okay. I, I read I read what you typed, mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't know if those were exact. Yeah, that's, that's his, his No, 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 I mean the entire com the conversation. Yeah. Was it just focusing on the Mahoney case or the totality of all the cases? Uh, because you got to remember, we had two other cases, too, that uh, he had done the same thing with, where he'd walked up holding his gun and threatening, and, and people were mm -hmm. thought that he was going to shoot them. Uh, so... Uh, <clears throat> while we were discussing it, he said in the future, if we do come up with it, then this is what has to happen. You have to take his uniform. You have to take his gun belt. Uh, you, you, you know, take pictures with it on, with it off, so that he has that to submit to the jury. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, he, he wanted that because, like, like the statute or the uh, jury instructions say it's what the average person or the you know the normal person mm -hmm. would, would see but or that, presume at the time. Yeah, so that, that definitely applies to impersonating a law enforcement officer. That wasn't just for that. That was for that charge of, uh, of, of carrying the concealed weapon. Okay. That was not for the impersonating. We had, we had more than enough for the impersonating on each time that we already had him charged. Okay. Were you aware of an email that was sent from General Counsel Austin Moore upstairs, our legal? To Sergeant Vidler saying there was nothing illegal about Metro State openly carrying pepper ball weapons. Mm -hmm. You were never aware of that? No, not until did, just recently. Did you hear Mr. DeWitt bringing it up in the interview multiple times? Uh, I do remember him saying something about an email, but he's also said he has emails from the Sheriff's Office mm -hmm. and back from 2015 where they picked his uniforms. Uh, he's never been able to provide them because uh, I've asked for them. Uh, he said he has emails from FHP saying he can do what he does, but he's never provided them. So, in this case, and though, I think in the interview he clearly says too. When I tell him, I'm not aware of these well, emails that you're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, I know you're not. Says it. Well, he does say that he uh, can get it on his phone at one point. And did you, did you not think it prudent to maybe look into that a little, little more? If he if he can provide it on his phone and you guys, I assume Sergeant Bidler had the phone at that point, right? Uh, I I didn't know who had it. I think there was some other discussion. Somebody somebody had his phone. Right, but I I know yeah I had no idea. Literally. Do you, do you think it Do you think it would, would have been prudent to look into that a little further, given no. everything? Not based on past uh, experience with him, no. Okay. Um, did you hear uh, Mr. Duet asking for a lieutenant? Or a captain multiple times. Yep. And he's also said he wants to talk to the sheriff, the under sheriff, the major, and one of them, you know, when we've had him stopped on the side of the road. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I arrested him on October 30th of 2019 uh, on the side of the road, mm -hmm. uh, Captain Carpenter pulled up as well. And I, I do believe during that time he asked to speak to somebody. Uh, and I went over and after he was handcuffed, I, I told him no, because we're just not going to do that. Uh, okay, so I went did over, you ever relay a message to the lieutenant or captain? He wants to speak with you? On on this particular incident, for yes. this? Correct. No, uh, uh, Keith Villar did. Okay. Uh, when we were standing there uh, in front of the desk, in front of the office, mm -hmm. uh, right at the end, just before uh, I, I did the whole thing about, you know, I'm going to be terminated for this, uh, Keith looked at uh, the captain and said, hey, by the way, since you're my lieutenant and my captain, he's requesting both uh, to speak with. And he said, I don't have anything to say to him. Okay. Acting Captain Crabb said that? Yes. Okay. All right, so um, let's uh, get into your interview a little bit. Um, you kind of explained how you ended up interviewing him. Um, I guess, uh, why, did you, why did you end up conducting a two-and-a-half-hour interview for a carrying concealed weapons charge is, is that something that's normal what's a normal time for an interview well when you arrest somebody for carrying concealed weapon on, on patrol right is it typical to go do a subsequent interview about that charge about that charge well i mean if they're going to talk to you about it yeah okay but i think i think two, two and, and a half hours is, well, do you I mean, feel like that was a good, good, uh, or reasonable, um, or a, an efficient use of, of agency resources? 
Uh, well, I think 40 minutes into it, 49 minutes into it or something, maybe not even 39 minutes into it, I told him I was done, but he wanted to keep talking at that point, I think. Uh, so at that point, I was just basically there just babysitting, just waiting for Keith. As a matter of fact, uh, I finally called Keith and go, hey, you know, where are you at? And he said, oh, I'm just finishing up the paperwork. Are you done? I go, uh, we've been done for a while, just been sitting here bullshitting. Okay. I think you hear that on my uh, body cam. As a matter of fact, I know you do. Okay. Um, I just want to read uh, part of a, a kind of a transcript from the from the video. Um, it says uh, this is kind of in the in the middle, uh, maybe about that around that same time you were talking about. Um, so Corp, uh, this is Mr. Duet. So Corp again, it's uh, it's in plain view. So where's the captain or lieutenant? You say I have no idea. Let me go check. I'm going to go and see if I can find somebody or see what bid they're doing, right? Um, and then he says, do I get to make a phone call today to my lawyer real fast? And you say, it won't be here. And he says, why? You let me last time. I've been answering your questions. And you say, because I don't have access to a phone like that, and you're not using my phone. Last time, yeah, I did. And Mr. Duet says, uh, he's, Sergeant Bidler's got my phone. Uh, let me use my phone real fast. You say, i got to go find him. Um, let me ask you. So we were talking, and then... You guys start to go into additional stuff. Do you kind of remember that mm -hmm. trans transaction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the, uh, so when I interviewed him October 30th of 2019, uh, he did the same thing. He asked for his phone or something, and I let him have his phone because I had it. Mm -hmm. I had possession of it. I let him so he can get phone numbers out. That's that's what he wanted. That's the way I took that then, too. He, he was just trying to get his phone numbers because if you continue with that, he says that. He says, well, can I you know, yep. get my phone number of my wife and my lawyer? And I said, yeah. And I, I said, I'll look it up for you. I said, I probably have your wife's number from the last time I called her and spoke with her when I interviewed her back then, but I didn't have it. Okay. Uh, so did, did you hear him request to call his attorney? Uh, and he just asked if he'd be able to use a phone. He didn't like, was, it wasn't like... Well, no, he didn't just ask to use his well, phone. You, he says, hey, I can, you can read it. Says, no, 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 I'm just asking, what are you referring to? Uh, do I get to make you? a phone call today to call my lawyer? Okay. Is it, would you take that as a request for a lawyer? Do I get to make a phone call today to call my lawyer? That's an ambiguous request for something. Yes. I, I think it's pretty specific. It's not very ambiguous. It's... I, can I call? Do, can I? Can I? Can I make, use a phone today to call my lawyer? Do well, I get yeah. to make a phone call today to call my lawyer? You think that's ambiguous? Well, I mean, well, I'll, give Why me the context. Why not provide him with the opportunity to call his lawyer? I'm not required to. You're you're right, um, but then you go in and continue questioning him for another. I think it's another hour and a half after that. Okay, we would just, what does legal guidance say when? That, that we get when somebody asks to call their attorney. Well. Says so the U.S. Supreme Court announced an opinion holding that police are not under, or I'm sorry, the police are under no obligation to stop an interrogation and clarify a suspect's uh, equivocal or ambiguous request for counsel. And that's Davis versus United States. This is Legal Bulletin 1995-003. Uh, it was published last in September of 2018. That's Orange County Legal Bulletin. That's one. Uh, and then it says that he basically has to invoke his right or say. I'm not talking to you anymore unless I have my lawyer here or I want to talk to my lawyer before I talk anymore. He didn't give any indication like that. What he says is, am I going to get to use a phone today to call my attorney? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, you think it's that's not going to be here. Based on legal bulletin, I was with them. Okay. Does that legal guidance also uh, suggest that um, you should, you should in, the, in the best practices, uh, clarify what he's asking? The legal bulletin per the, the state 
and the Supreme Court does not say that. Okay, but I just want to be clear. So you believe that this is an ambiguous request. Do I get to make a phone call today to call my, to my lawyer real fast? Yeah, do it. If he said, I don't want to talk to you anymore, I want to call my lawyer right now, that would be completely different. Him saying, am I going to get to use a phone today to call my lawyer? Well, of course you are, because when you know when you get to the jail that they have the free phones right there for you. Okay, did you uh, make any attempt to um, clarify that statement? I did. I told him I was. I, I didn't have a phone for him to use. He wasn't going to use mine. And he, that's not clarifying. That, that's that's telling him that you're you're denying him. Well, that, that. per the legal bulletin right here, these two, I'm not required to to uh, give a clear statement and try to figure out what he's trying to say. But I did. I said I just told him I'm going to use my phone. If he had said, well, then. I, I, I need to talk to my lawyer before I say anything else. I wouldn't have talked to him anymore at all. Uh, and beyond that, anyway, it was just literally, I was just sitting there waiting for Keith to get done with his report. Uh, but, all right. <clears throat> Did you continue to question him after this interaction? Yes, we went back and forth talking. I don't know if it was true questioning, it was more just going talking. Um, okay. So at the end of the interview, uh, Sergeant Bidler engaged in some seemingly uh, personal conversation with Mr. DeWitt. He was talking about uh, how Keith had just bought $750,000 in construction equipment, and, mm -hmm. and there was um, some talk about uh, the YouTube videos and uh, whether or not he's starting funeral companies and stuff like that. Um, do you think that that was appropriate at the end, what he was doing there? I think what he was trying to do is, he was trying to tell DeWitt to stop putting out misinformation that, because that's what DeWitt was doing, he was putting it out there that Keith was trying to uh, start his own funeral escort business, which was not true at all. So uh, I think that's what he was doing. As a matter of fact, even at the end right there, they went back and forth about a concealment, and then he asked DeWitt, how do you know what I'm carrying? How can you tell by just looking at it right here? And he goes, I can't. So he finally, he wouldn't say it there while I was talking to him, but as soon as Keith came in there, he finally said, yeah, I can't tell what's in your holster. So he confirmed what we'd been saying. Okay. All right. Um, so now I want to uh, kind of move on from that a little bit. Go to the... Uh um, some of the investigative stuff. Um, what are the general responsibilities of a corporal in the motor unit? Uh, well, like everybody, doesn't matter what unit you're in, your first and utmost is to uh, protect and serve and to investigate and to, uh, you know, handle citizen complaints in any manner. So for us and motors, we do everything that every other deputy does. And on top of that, we... Uh, uh, specialize in uh, the traffic section, uh, uh, traffic complaint areas, uh, any kind of criminal behavior that relates to traffic. So that could be like road rage, okay. uh, dignitary escort. I mean, it's, it's a numerous things. And okay. part of that as is a corporal, corporal is a supervisor as well. Yeah, you're a supervisor, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so when did you kind of first begin investigating Metro State? When the first time, when did it start? first time was in 2015, when uh, Captain Gardner, he was our lieutenant at the time, came to me, and I think Mike Wilson, or maybe he was already working with Mike Wilson, but uh, he said that the three of us were going to be uh, conducting this investigation in the Metro State, and uh, when you say the three of us, the lieutenant, myself, and uh, Mike Wilson, who was a corporal at the time. Okay. Uh, and I don't remember who the captain was at the time. I think it was Chappie, Captain Chapman, I think. Uh, so, yeah, so we were starting the investigation for that. I know uh, uh, Wilson and I had met with the, the uh, state attorney, the head state attorney guys, the head judges for the traffic section and somewhere else, I don't remember exactly who. 
uh, and we went over everything on how to proceed with this. And and uh, at that time, uh, we were looking at doing the impersonating, but they didn't feel comfortable with us just arresting uh, based on what we see, even though we could. Uh, they wanted a victim uh, as well. So they wanted, you know, if we came across them like this, if, to try to get a victim statement to proceed. Okay. Uh, and then we started doing a bunch of stuff with Chase. Uh, we introduced a motorcycle. Wilson rode a, uh, a decoy bike. And this was back in 2015. I, I don't, 2015. I don't want to rehash the... No, I'm, I'll finish it up. So we, we did that, and then all of a sudden we were told uh, to, to stand down. And then I had the contact with him, with my guys. We heard them going by. We were coming out from lunch, and we were standing behind... Uh, Oh, uh, Tropa Grill, Polo Tropa Grill, I think, on uh, 441, and uh, up by Clare Conoco area. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, we're standing out back, and we heard, my whole squad did, including the sergeant, we heard uh, these air horns going by. We thought somebody stole a police vehicle and was just running down the road honking them. So I was in my car that day. The guys were on their bikes, and uh, they caught up to them which, you know, I had the video, and then and, and they made contact with DeWitt, and then they went and made contact with the other guys. Uh, and then DeWitt and I sat down on the side of the road, and he claims that I've written him multiple tickets. I don't think I've ever written him one ticket. Okay. I just, I just well, that's that. want to so, be, be clear. I so I'm there, getting to it. Was that back in 2015, or was that 2015, recently? And 2015. And then after that stop, uh, uh, Larry Krantz, who I think was our major at the time, met with the entire motor unit up at uh, Levo as on our training day and said he's off limits do not have any interaction with him leave him alone so we all did in 2019 uh, Captain Carpenter got with Sergeant Vidler I guess he had had some type of uh, run-in with them or witnessed them based on what uh, Sandy had told us or told me was that he was coming out of somewhere and saw them going yeah. by with lights and sirens? So I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I, I don't need to rehash the the whole investigation. Just well, that's how you guys I got involved in it. No, I asked when oh, okay. did you start an investigation. So, uh, so Sandy there started was another with investigation him. in 2019. Right. right. So Sandy, so I, I just want to ask this: um, Why was the Motors Unit doing this investigation? So Sandy met uh, with Keith. Keith came to me. And I said, based on what happened last time with Major Krantz, here's the file. And it was pretty thick. I gave it everything I had to Keith. I think that was, I want to say it was like March or so, it was towards the beginning of uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. I think right after the uh, incident with our deputy, the off-duty deputy, uh, Sandy came to me and said, you're going to be, and, and did this with, uh, in front of my sergeant and in front of uh, Cal Wacker, uh, you're going to be working with Keith on this. The two of you are going to be working the, this case and, and any other cases so we can get this guy off the road. And I know that Keith, Major Anzuedo, uh, Sandy Carpenter, I guess Austin and maybe somebody else, I don't know, had a meeting. And that's when, I mean, they'd already kind of started looking at him earlier but that's when it it took off was right then and that okay. was in September of uh, 2019 okay uh, did you as part of that in 2019 did you conduct a fraud investigation um, in which mr. Constantine was a reporter I did of a fraud uh, what steps did you take as part of that investigation well when he first <laughs> We had gotten called to his property, and, and I forgot what the issue was, but because I, I didn't even know that that's where Metro State had moved. But we got a call there, so Keith and I went over there. Was uh, that on uh, September 24th, 2019? That could have been. Sounds That sounds close to it. Okay. Uh, that, that's when the whole incident when they said that Keith broke into the office. Yeah, that was that day. Okay. So, yes. So, we got called over there. Uh... While we're standing out front, if you watch the video, you can see me uh, getting off my bike because I was on my bike that day. Keith was in his car. And Tony's coming over to me. I've never met the guy. And uh, he's telling me about uh, this tow truck and, and how he loaned money to 
to do it for this uh, money and, and, and he's trying to rip them off and everything. Mm -hmm. So he showed me some paperwork and asked me are, are these legitimate liens or whatever. So I looked him up and I go, yeah, but it's not on the vehicle that you think it is. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, it's on this other vehicle, the F-250, not the F-550, which is the tow truck. So we're going back and forth and I, and, and so I, I like, you know what? I said, this looks civil. It sounds like you all entered into some kind of agreement, it's civil. So he goes, okay, I said, you need to get a lawyer. So then I wanna say in October, he called up and wanted to come in and bring documents in. And uh, I believe he spoke with Keith and Keith told me to meet him at the office. So I met with Tony, interviewed him again. He brought in some documents and, and the documents he brought on itself just was, it still kind of looked civil. And, and I told him that, I said, we'll look at it. I said, but this looks civil. So then the beginning of November, probably towards the middle of November, once we got the evidence from the search warrant we did and we're reviewing everything, probably actually in December, I want to say December 3rd maybe or something, there was so much stuff on, on these computers and on the phone dumps and everything. So I'm going through them and I find where he illegally recorded Tony Constantini uh, making this deal for the vehicles and even tells him, yeah, I put the lien on it and everything. <clears throat> so what I found troubling with that was when I interviewed him in, uh, in October, I guess, when I arrested him, when I interviewed him, Jeremy DeWitt, he told me that Tony broke into the office and stole the titles and put the liens on it himself. And uh, so we went back and forth on that and I mean, I didn't have proof either way, so I didn't know. And, and if you listen to that interview, I even tell him, I, 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 I'm, I'm totally honest, I said, I'm gonna tell you, Tony brought this to us, and at this point, unless something changes, I've told him it's civil. Okay. So. Did you write a report? No. Okay, why not? I was ordered not to. Ordered not to by who? Sandy Carpenter. I was ordered, <coughs> we were ordered. Specifically to this, this report, or? Was that a... Uh, well, we, multiple times. Uh, we were had a uh, interception of communication, another recording incident with one of the state attorneys, I guess the third over there or whatever, uh, or the head investigator or whatever his name is, James or something. And we had uh, an FBI agent out of Maitland. We made contact with both of them. They wanted to prosecute. We set up times to go do the interviews. And the day of the interview, uh, we were told, one was at 9, one was at 11. We were told, uh, you're not doing it, you're not doing a report on this, you're done with that. Uh, Specific to this case? Or is I'm this giving you general? in general that in multiple reports we were told not to do. It wasn't just one. Okay. You were told to wrap up an investigation, right? Well, if you want to put it that way, but it wasn't quite like that, yeah. How, how was it? Uh, well, it started off, we met with Anzuedo, Chief Zwig, uh, Sandy Carpenter was there, myself and Keith, and we were going over everything, and they said, how much time do you need? And we told them we needed, uh, I think we told them like three months or so. They asked us to leave the room, and then I think Anzuedo came outside or called us back in or, or spoke to us or maybe Sandy, I don't remember which two, but or at least both of them, because I, I know I heard it from both of them. Uh, they said you have until January 31st. As a matter of fact, I, I know Ann's waiter told us that because he said uh, he tried to get us more time with the chief, but that was the best that he could do. That was what they felt comfortable with, until January 31st. Then December uh, 9th or so, uh, one of our civilian volunteers uh, was arrested for impersonating over in Osceola, and the, I guess the undersheriff was uh, really very upset about it. On December 11th, Anzuedo uh, told Keith that, and uh, so then that Friday, I'm pretty sure it was either Thursday or Friday after that, Anzuedo called me to his office. He called uh, Keith to his office, but Keith had already uh, was gone for the day he had off duty to work or something and so we did a phone conference with him while I was in Enzueto's office and he said uh, you know the, the sheriff is 
the sh he said the undersheriff of the sheriff is very upset about this arrest, and you now have until December 31st to wrap this up. That's, that, that was the marching orders. Okay, so why didn't you complete this report? I'm getting to it. Yeah, <coughs> on December 31st. On uh, that evening, or Saturday, Keith got a call from Sandy saying he wanted us in his office Monday morning for new marching orders and that we had to be uh, done in like a week. Didn't know the exact time. We go to Sandy's office and he tells us uh, that you have until the end of the week, which would have been, I think, December 20th, to have this done. Whatever is not done, you will leave. You will not continue investigating. You will not continue writing on anything. If it's not done, then I will discipline you for failure to perform. You will leave it alone. Put it down, walk away. I don't, and because I made the comment of, we have cases, there's no way we can type all this stuff. He says, you will be done with it because if you're still working on any of it, after the 20th, I will discipline you. And, uh, did you pull a case number for this one? I did. Okay. And you didn't complete the report? I didn't have time. Okay. I, was, I, I couldn't, not without getting disciplined. If I had continued it now, okay. I brought it up uh, to uh, the state attorney, Steve Miller, mm -hmm. at least twice, saying that uh, I, I couldn't get this report done. I said I couldn't do it. I got all the information on it. I just could never type it. And I said, it's a good case. Uh, we went over it. He agreed. I'm, I'm sorry. I got I to gotta, I gotta stop you there. You said it was civil. Well, how, yeah, until how, I found... How is it coming to the state, attorney, the state attorney's attention? Because if you remember what I told you, I said it was civil at that time, but then after we started going through everything, I found evidence that said the opposite, that said it was criminal. This, okay. this was an intentional thing. The illegal so then, recording was, that was... And I know in the report so from fast Bell... fast forward to uh, just recently, you wrote a nine-page report that said that Mr. DeWitt did a number of, of crimes. One of those is the the... Uh, recording, mm -hmm. um, and then a bunch of other things, and uh, you you um, listed Mr. Dewitt as a suspect. Mm -hmm. Why did you not file that? If if why didn't I file it? Why did I send it to uh, Economic Crimes? Right. I was ordered to. Okay. If I, I believe, if you look at the email that you have from uh, from uh, Captain Scatero, he told me once you complete the report, have your current supervisor approve it, and and then send it to. Uh, they said economic crimes or the appropriate investigation. It should have been filed. I should have filed it because I had the charges. I had the PC. Uh, I've never had where I had everything put together and then I send it to somebody else. Okay. Uh, that would have been for the, the state to decide if they were going to pursue it or not. And, and would you agree that fraud investigations are highly specialized investigations? They can be, yeah. I've worked on some that were extremely uh, large. Like what? Uh, in, like as a past. detective, yeah, in as a Sanford. detective, yeah. I had one, this guy went to, uh, I'll just give you part of an example. He went to Absolute Sound and uh, ordered a bunch of stuff. What he was doing is he uh, made up his own credit cards, made up his own checks. He was buying police equipment, selling at the Seminole County uh, and other jurisdictions within Seminole County, defrauding uh, uh, casinos. Uh, okay, so you, uh, I don't know. No, I, I, I I've worked to, some big ones. I don't need to hear the... Well, you're asking for my experience. I, no. I'm trying to give you just a little. No. I, I've worked them, and I know that they can be okay. entailed. Yes. Uh, and by policy, we have our fraud investigations would go to uh, a specific unit, right? Well, uh, impersonating a police officer also goes to a specific, it goes to intel. But we were ordered by uh, uh, Chief Swig. We were told we don't need any other help from anybody. Okay. That we. I've worked racketeering cases. Uh, I was, as a matter of fact, I, I helped start the Auto Theft Task Force in Seminole County. I was part of that group. Did you consult uh, with the Economic Crimes Unit during this? I did. During your fraud investigation back then? I did. In 2019? I did. Who'd you talk to? Uh, Margaret Keltz, I believe. She was the corporal in the unit at the time. Okay, what she did. Little short girl. Uh, I went to her. I went over the case and told her what I had. Uh, I told her I haven't I haven't written up the report itself yet because I'm waiting on stuff to come back from the state of Florida. 
And uh, I thought we had until July 31st, so I was going to put it all together and then just have her review it for me. And uh, she said, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I pretty much went through the details of exactly what it was, how I thought it was civil in the beginning, the second time, and then when this information that we gathered from the search warrant proved otherwise, that it, it wasn't intentional and it was criminal. Uh, and, and so, yeah, she, I told her I was going to send it over to her, or bring it to her, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, I met her, if you open investigations up there, I, I went up looking for her, or looking for either the corporal or the sergeant of economic crimes, because I didn't know who it was. I went up there looking for him, and somebody told me that she was, I guess, the hallway that goes between the cubicles where the printers and stuff are, she was in there doing something with a copy machine or a printer or something. And so we had the whole conversation right there. Uh, okay. And that was just prior to being told to shut it down. There was no way I could get it to anybody. There was no way I could do this case. I mean, we had everything else going on. There was there was absolutely no way. And I tried to I tried to say it, but Sandy was very clear. If uh, you're working on anything beyond the twentieth, I'm going to discipline you. Okay. Uh, we'd even prior so, prior so to that, I said I, I think it's important I tell you this. Okay, go okay? ahead. Because you're asking why I would be so worried about completing a report. I've never, never not completed a report. I've always completed my reports. It was very important that this report was done. I made that clear multiple times with the state attorney. I said, but I can't do anything unless you send an email. That came straight from high ups that if, if you task us, we can do it. He just never did, and I don't know why. I know that he was getting a lot of pushback from the sheriff's office as well. But a week prior to the deadline being given, the, the final deadline, I said that what's happening here with this investigation and the interference, I've never seen this before. It is weird. And I said, I don't feel comfortable with this and some of the orders being given, like don't put anything in writing or emails. I don't feel comfortable with that. And I'm Let a whistleblower. This. I'm, I'm, whistle I'm going I'm to ask you this, okay? Is, is uh, the, uh, Captain Carpenter, mm -hmm. is he your superior? Mm -hmm. And so... Is there a uh, management prerogative to the decisions that are made at management? Do they have the ability to make decisions? Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, was a decision made and an order given? Was it, yeah. Okay. And, and by managers have that prerogative? As long as it's legal, doesn't violate ethics, it's not immoral, yes. Okay. okay. So then uh, he gave this direction. I, I told him, I said, I'm a whistleblower because I'm blowing the whistle on this. I said, something is wrong here. Okay. He ignored us. The following day, the, that Monday, he said it again, and he said, if either one of you think, and this is his exact words, I, it's like burned in my head. If either one of you think you're going to be a whistleblower, you'll be terminated. That was after he told us, uh, if, you don't fin uh, if you're not done by the 20th, a whistleblower to what? It's management prerogative. They're, he's giving you a directive, okay. which managers have the ability to do, correct? Mm -hmm. As long as it's ethical, not illegal, and not immoral. Okay. All right. Um, I think I uh, covered everything with the... Did you eventually write the report? I did. Did you read uh, Sergeant Bell's supplement? I did, and, and uh, Captain Scotero called me, and oh, well, we, we, he sent me an email, and then we talked on the phone, and I told him my experience in 2019 in December, and, and uh, that I, I was not comfortable. I said, because, because of all this, I'm now being transferred to five. If I do this, am I going to be transferred somewhere else or whatever? And he said, no. He goes, disregard whatever last order you received, and go ahead and complete the report. Okay. And he told me he was going to put that in an email form and send it back to me. He didn't quite put it that way, but when I sent my email back, I made sure to put that in there, which he replied to as check, as he received it and understood. Okay. Um, so uh, kind of along the same lines with Mr. Constantine on that September 24th, 2019, uh, you guys went to the business. Um, I think you, you explained it, but you had a lawful right to be there. Yes, if, and if I may ask, why didn't we not interview him? Mr. Constantine? Yes, sir. Um, because the what we're looking at is I'm not looking at the investigation. I'm looking at policy violations okay. um, and, and whether or not a report was submitted in a timely manner. Right. That has nothing to do with him. Uh, that has something to do with you 
Um, and so that's the reason why we didn't talk to him. Um, but I just wanted to confirm, do you have a lawful right to be there that day? Yes. Okay. Um, did you see Sergeant Vither open a window? No. All right. Um, did he go in the biz? Did Sergeant Vither go in the business? No. Uh, did you go in the business? No. Okay. Um, with regard to uh, an allegation that was made by Mr. DeWitt on October 30th, 2019, uh, he, he alleged that um, his cell phone, he, he was arrested, you arrested him mm -hmm. on that day, and he was arrested. He was in jail. He was talking to his wife on the phone, and he alleged that his cell phone was pinging at um, a business. Uh, his I think he said that what, what he said was, depends on what story you listen to, but the one he told you all in, here in PSD when he came in, he said that uh, his wife said that uh, it was coming from his house heading to his business, and then it stopped at his business. Okay. Uh, did you have Mr. Dewitt's cell phone? At that I had point? two of them and an iPad and his wallet, yeah, all of his wallet. Were those seized as evidence as yes. part of the arrest? Mm -hmm. um, did you go into and access Mr. Dewitt's phone? Nope, I didn't even put it in airplane mode. I, 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 apparently you have to put it in airplane mode, but uh, I didn't even do that because I thought we were getting a warrant and uh, our tech people would come out and they would take possession of it then, okay. but that didn't happen. So you didn't go into his phone? Never did anything uh, with him. You go into the iPad? Nope, never did anything with him. Um, I know he claims because that's how we found his business. That's not true. We knew where his business was before that. How? Uh, well, one of our uh, informants told us exactly where it was. Sergeant Villar had been sitting on it for days. Uh, I'm going to say days. I mean, I don't. I know he was sitting on it because he in the evenings he was following because we were doing the uh, the stuff with the security side too. Mm -hmm. uh, so he knew exactly where it was. Uh, he, as a matter of fact, he had to give me the address to get to it. Okay. Because I, I, I kind of knew the area where it was, but I didn't know where it was. So he gave me the actual address so I would, you know, go right to it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, are you aware of Sergeant Miller going to uh, private businesses to speak negatively of Mr. DeWitt? Not aware of any of that. Um, were, were you aware of him going to any businesses, telling them to cancel their contracts or don't do business with Metro State? No. Um, so after everything that we've kind of talked about, um, would you agree that, that uh, someone could, could look at the circumstances surrounding this and come to the conclusion that this, this was a, a personal arrest, a pers like it had, had some personal element to it for Sergeant Midler, uh, you as a witness to this arrest? Um, would you agree that, that somebody could look at that and say that this is intentional and personal to Sergeant Bidler? I don't no, I don't think so. Why not? Because I don't think so. I don't I think I think <clears throat> uh, I think DeWitt and his constant YouTubing has tried to make it look that way. Uh, but it's not personal because if it was then we would have been out there every day when we could look for him and be searching for him and doing all this stuff when we weren't. That, no. He was, it, it just wasn't, I didn't, I didn't find it to be personal at all. Keith, Keith's a lot like me. Uh, when, when you're given a task, you want to follow it through and do it the best that you can. You're not going to like just half-ass it. Uh, so I think, I think he puts in all of his effort into everything he does. That's just him, you know? Okay. Somebody who goes out and runs, they don't just kind of jog along. If they're gonna do it, they're gonna put the full effort into it. And that, that's, that's the way I see him. I don't, he never gave me any indication at all, ever, that it was personal. As a matter of fact, he went and dismissed tickets for him and I told him not to do it. When he went and dismissed the tickets for the lights, I said, that's exactly how he's been getting away all this time is because we either dismiss it or his lawyer makes it sound like, see, we beat them all. That's not true, because I've been to most of those cases, the hearings. Go in there, and, and they get a judge. He always requests a judge. And he tells the judge, hey, look, he's going to fix it. He's trying to get his business going. And then somebody has pity on him. They don't realize that this is a constant thing with this guy. So they go, okay, we'll just dismiss it. It's just this. We'll just dismiss it. So then he then turns around and makes it sound like it's this big thing. 
So okay. I told Keith, I wouldn't, but Keith's like, look, it's the right thing to do. He's trying to comply. And I'm like, well, I agree with that too. So it, it was kind of a double-edged sword, but okay. yeah, I don't think he do had you, any. Do you, do you know of any ill will that Sergeant Miller has towards Mr. DeWitt? Mm -mm. No, not do at all. Do you have any ill will towards Mr. DeWitt? Nope. And if you listen to interviews, I tell him that. He, the guy had a great business concept for everything he was trying to do. His ambulance thing, his tow truck thing, his, it's just, he didn't want to do it legally. That was the only thing. I told him, man, if you would just do it, I mean, I wish I could do it. You know, if I didn't have so much time here and, and my career here, his ambulance thing that okay. Michael Bream is involved in, has a lot of money invested in, uh, that right there, that is brilliant because the way he was going to do it was, that's just, it's money hands over fist. So, okay. all right, give us one second. Let me uh, just step out real quick. Take, take a little also. bit of a break. Sure. Since the recording is still. Yep. Oh. I gotta take this mask off.
Actually, yeah, I don't, don't have anything else. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, I'll go ahead and uh, conclude it. The uh, current time is uh, 9.53 a.m.